My guest on the podcast today is Bill O'Hanlon. Bill is a world-renowned leader in the fields of psychotherapy and clinical hypnosis. He's the author of nearly 40 books and has delivered thousands of talks around the world. He was featured on the Oprah Winfrey Show with his book, Do One Thing Different. Though now mostly retired from the mental health field, Bill still offers a few online courses a year, sometimes with occasional group consulting. Along with teaching clinical skills around psychotherapy and hypnosis, Bill also teaches others how to write and publish their own books and how to become paid public speakers. He studied with Milton Erickson, and we're going to be talking today about how Erickson influenced him and his storytelling, and perhaps even leading up to how he is now spending a lot of his time in Nashville, Tennessee as a songwriter. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Very cool, very honored to have Bill O'Hanlon here. Bill is one of my favorite authors about um, Ericksonian stuff. Um, he has in the background, when you see it, the picture of Bill, um, his one of, well, several of the books that I have enjoyed very much, but Taproots really stood out for me as one of the seminal books that uh, sort of kind of put it all together for me. I've been studying what I could of Ericksonian hypnosis over the years from various people and other books that I've gotten. When I got to Taproots, it's kind of like just, Put it all together for me. So, uh, that's, uh, that's why I wrote it to a certain extent, because, you know, I studied with Dr. Erickson when I was in graduate school. I couldn't afford to pay him, so I was his gardener. I was his work-study student. And I had learned uh, what was the beginnings of NLP. NLP wasn't invented at that time. It got invented a little later, named a little later. And I thought, well, I know what Erickson's doing because NLP got the essence of it. And I, I done my master's research on NLP. And so I figured I knew it. I went out to see Erickson and I was totally overwhelmed. NLP got some of what he did and helped me understand it better, but I was absolutely confused and overwhelmed sitting with Erickson. And he was like a Zen master. He kind of liked that confusion. He liked to get you out of your head and into your experience. And I was so frustrated trying to understand it that it took me about um, five or six years of just absolutely like you, I think, obsessively getting anything I could about Erickson, going to workshops, reading books, listening to audio tapes. And still, it was not quite coming together. And I remember the day it started to just coalesce for me. And I thought, this is so great. I got to write a book about this. And I never really had... I you know, thought about writing a book, but I didn't think I was really up for it because I wasn't an author. And that book was really the bringing together of all those years of obsessive studying of Erickson, trying to make him a little more sensible because I didn't want to lose the mystery of Erickson. He was great for that, but I did want to make it a little more accessible because I was really, like you, really excited about sharing with the world what this guy did. And everybody saw him as this sort of confusing, idiosyncratic, one-off guy. No one else could do what he did. But I think you and I have both uh, given the lie to that, that you can teach other people some of this stuff. Not everything. Erickson was his unique weirdness and genius that will never be reproduced by anybody but you can get a lot of pieces of it in that book i tried to put in as many pieces as i could figure out well i'm i'm grateful that you did that and it's funny for me to hear you say because because i'm i'm not an author because <laughs> you have now written how many books 18 or something 35 <laughs> 35 i want credit for every one of those damn books <laughs> 35 books. Stop me before I write again. I've actually stopped for a few years because I'm focusing on another thing we have in common, which is uh, music and songwriting. So oh, I'm focusing right. on that um, rather than writing. I have to restrain myself. I have five books outlined on my computer. It's like, don't write, don't write, don't write. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll get to those as well so that the rest of the world can have them. Um, meanwhile, this interview will be featured on this website. Obviously, who's ever watching this knows this already, but the ericksonian.info website, um, where, you know, hopefully people are going who have that curiosity like you and I shared before about, you know, how 
do you do this? What is Ericksonian hypnosis? What is Ericksonian psychotherapy? I mean, what is this stuff? And um, if somebody's just starting out, uh, besides reading your book, Taproots, and uh, all, all of your other books that you've written now, um, what would you say somebody would would do? I mean, Erickson is gone. Yeah. Um, one of the things that is intri intriguing to me is when I studied, you know, a little bit that I have with you and I've attended a lecture or two that you've done at some seminars or symposiums I've been at and Stephen Gilligan and various other people that I've been able to get into, learn from. Um, it seems like because Erickson taught in his kind of open-ended way that everybody sort of took their little viewpoint of it and sort of went with it in that particular direction. So as I studied with all these different people, I was like getting various different viewpoints of what Ericksonian hypnosis really was. So how does somebody do that now, what would you say? Yeah, I'd say it's easier actually because you have these multiple points of view and Erickson really encouraged that. He basically said, let a thousand flowers bloom, let people come here from, you know, Bandler who came from a more technical background and, you know, use words like algorithms and, you know, try to find the structure of things to Gilligan, who was much more Jungian, sort of uh, very poetic and spiritual in his approach. To me, who I like to analyze the patterns. One thing I liked about NLP was they were always looking for patterns that work, patterns that didn't work. So I was always looking for patterns. And so I think a bunch of people have looked at it from a bunch of points of view, but find some of those basic books. I would say go back. It's hard to read Erickson. He wasn't the greatest author or writer. He didn't write really any books by himself. He collaborated on a few, but he was much more an in-person teacher than, and more experiential teacher than he was an analytical person about his work. So I'd find some of those students that you like, you know, the, some of the books um, that I started with, the Jay Haley's Uncommon Therapy is a really nice one, bunch of stories, but it has a structure to it. And again, he came at it from a developmental point of view, a family development, life cycle development thing, and then fit all of Erickson's work within that model, although that's, I don't think how Erickson thought, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, and then the next book I really like to tell people to read is My Voice Will Go With You, which has a bunch of stories of Erickson. You know, you and I, again, this is one of our three commonalities. We love this Ericksonian stuff. We love music. And we love stories. And um, so stories to me were the, you know, the, the prime way of getting into Erickson. He was such a good storyteller. I mean, I came from a family, as you probably did, because we're from the Irish tradition, of some storytellers. But I'd never met a storyteller like Erickson before. He used stories to change people. And he, once he started a story, you could not stop it. He, you know, it was amazing. He was, by the end, end of his life, by the time I knew him in, his, in, the, in, his, uh, in the 70s and in his 70s, he was very slow. And he would tell these long, drawn-out stories. But I was on the edge of my seat. Sorry, I've got a phone call coming in. I forgot to turn off my phone ringer. Um, and so I think stories are a great way to get into Erickson. So that's interesting that you should say that. Because Erickson is certainly a very different kind of storyteller than the in kind of Irish. Yeah, in that you know, charming, uh, entertaining sort of style. And with a little twinkle in the eye. He had a little of that. But... His were therapeutic stories, teaching stories in a lot of ways. So I think it's a different tradition of storytelling, although he had some shaggy dog stories and some jokes he would tell. Mainly when he was doing hypnosis or therapy, he told stories. And I think that's one of the things that I want to say that, you know, I was trained as a traditional therapist. I was I was trained in sort of, at first, Carl Rogers, kind of just asking a question, listening and reflecting back, which I discovered when I went into practice was not that helpful for me. A few people changed that way, but very, very few. They mostly came back every week because they liked the warm, fuzzy feeling, but they really weren't changing out there. So I was casting about, and I came across Banley Grinder and Erickson, and those were a little more active approaches, and I really like that. What, what, what kind of blew my mind about Erickson, it took me a few years to get this, is that he wasn't, he didn't have a model of what was healthy or not healthy. He didn't have a normative model for like, okay, you've got to be like this, or else you're mentally unhealthy or emotionally unhealthy or psychologically or relationally unhealthy. 
He was just helping you get over whatever stuckness you had. And the way he did that, because he didn't have a normative model, some sort of psychological construct that he had to fit you in, he used, instead of guidance or instruction, many people thought he was a guider. He wasn't that much of a guider. He was more of an evoker. And that really blew my mind about the kind of hypnosis he did, because before I knew much about hypnosis, I thought, like most people thought, people are just going to, you, know, you will go deeply. They'll just tell you what to do and make you do it through your unconscious and or your subconscious. And when I got to Erickson, he was doing something totally different from that. Permissive, very non-authoritarian, which he'd started out. So he still had some of those elements. But he evoked. He you know, Steve Langton wrote a book called The Answer Within. He thought people had resources and answers within. So it was a resource rather than a deficit model. That really impressed me. Secondly, it wasn't a tell you what to do or make you do things. It was an evoke from you what you already knew and then to use it in a way to help you relieve your suffering or make changes. And that was a revolution for me. And it it's never gone away from me, that kind of orientation to evoking rather than imposing or directing or instructing, which is most of psychotherapy as far as I can tell. Oh, that's, that's, that's really fascinating. Just a quick question as an aside, I, I want to stay focused on Erickson, but you mentioned Carl Rogers and um, evoking, and, and that reminded me of Frank Fairley. Are, are you familiar with his work? Yeah, I, I sponsored a workshop for Frank back in the day, and uh, I love, I, I, it was the first clinical thing I'd ever heard, was a Frank Fairley audio tape, which this woman had tried to commit suicide, and he was telling her she hadn't done it well, and he was saying she'd even muck that up, and I was like, I was fascinated. The rest of the class in my psychology school was just appalled. I was like, I love this guy, but I'm not going to say thanks to all these very sensitive psychological types. I thought he was funnier than heck, and he got her to defend herself and get, she was kind of listless when she started, and, you know, a victim. She was like, you can't talk to people like that. This is terrible, you know. She was really activated after that, and I, was, I sought his work out, and I read the first book. Um, that was published by Meta Publications back in the day, right. and then later sponsored a workshop. And the terrible thing it was when no one could smoke in public. He insisted on having an ashtray, and he'd smoke like a chimney during the workshop. Like we had to find a venue that would actually allow that, which was really hard. So huh. that was in his contract. It was like the no brown M and M's. Basically, he had to have lots of <laughs> ashtrays, and it had to be a place where he smoked. He was quite a character. That and the brown M and M's. He was a sticker yeah. for that. Yeah, he didn't say anything. <laughs> That's very funny. Yeah, when we brought him to New York, I guess he'd quit smoking. So uh, oh, he had good because ultimately, so I think part of what did him in. So yeah. yeah. Thank goodness. So getting back to Milton. Um, so starting now. The the idea that the a normative model or the pr evoking rather than prescribing kind of thing. Um, what would be the best way for a person, aside from reading the books, but if I wanted to go to, let's say I was, let's say I'm in college, let's say I'm, I'm young. I'd like to pretend that was true. Let's, let's say I am, I'm young. Let's, let's, let's use our imaginings. Okay. I can go with that. I can go. You were one, a young once, I'm sure. Yes, I was. I, I remember it like yesterday, but yeah. seriously now folks, um, what should they study? What, what, where should they go to school for this? What, what kind of thing would a person? Well, I would look up whoever is teaching solution focused and solution oriented therapies. There's a few schools that do that. There's, okay. um, there's something down in, uh, down in Florida, um, that has a program, graduate school program in that, and just ask around. Solution-focused, solution-oriented were two structured approaches that came out of the more evocative approaches to therapy rather than the more instructive, normative, directive approaches. So I would ask around about that. 
Yeah, I think that's the best way to, to do it. But again, it's not mainstream. It's still not mainstream. It's mostly cognitive behavioral therapy, which is very structured and very directive. It has an idea of what good thoughts are and what bad thoughts are. And it'll try and guide you towards the good thoughts, which I think is ridiculous. But whatever, it's just my, my idea because I'm so opposed to that normative model. I think the normative model is what's messed up a lot of people, you know, the women who came to the Freudians and they weren't having the right kind of orgasm because they needed clitoral stimulation rather than vaginal, you know, and it's just crazy stuff. All the gay people who came, the transgender people who came to therapy, the cross-cultural things, that misunderstandings that happened, you know, they, people got imposed upon by those normative models. So I have a great antipathy towards them. And even if they, you know, obviously every kind of therapy can help people, some people in some way, but also we have to be very careful not to oppress people and impose our values. And it's very easy, especially as a white male guy, to impose your limited, you know, experiential background and point of view on people that are different from how you prefer to see things and have experienced things. So I, that's one of the things that really attracted me to Erickson. In the 50s, he was helping a gay woman and a gay man get together and kind of cover for each other because that was dangerous in those days, as it still is somewhat, uh, mm -hmm. less so than it was then to come out as uh, homosexual. So. Hmm. Wow. I did not know that story. That's interesting. So therapeutically, um, what is the process then if someone comes to you for therapy? Um, and well, again, because it's not a narrative or it's not a normative model, you have to find out what's bothering them. It, it's so simple to me. What are you concerned about? What's bothering you? Or what's bothering somebody else that got them to push you into coming to see me, which uh -huh. sometimes yeah. happens, and find out who's concerned and what they're concerned about. So the simplest way to start is not what's your diagnosis, what's wrong with you. It's what are you concerned about? So I like that language rather than that pathological, you're messed up, you've got a diagnosis, you're ADD, you're depressive, you know, whatever. I'm not much on that. I'm just like, what's concerning you? Well, I can't get out of bed. Okay, well, I don't need to know anything about, you know, diagnoses for that. That's our goal then is to help you get out of bed. Why do you want to get out of bed? Well, because I want to do this. I want to get to work. I want to, you know, hang out with my kids or my wife or my husband or whatever it may be. So, you know, my friends, I want to do something. I want to have some joy in my life. So I want to find out what they're concerned about and what they long for. Those are the two things that always start my inquiries with people. What are you suffering from? What are you complaining about? What are you concerned about? And what do you long for? We're, you know, a colleague of mine, uh, Steve DeShazer, who created Solution Focused Therapy, one of those offshoots of the Ericksonian approach, used to say when people would show up, how will we know when we're supposed to stop meeting like this? Which is a kind of a fun way of saying, how will we know when it's over? And so almost always I shift as soon as I can to the future and where they want to be. Not where I want them to be, not where my values say they should be, but where do they want to be? And obviously if they say, I want to go out and shoot up a bunch of people, I have a few values that I probably won't go with. You know, I want to I want to let my husband beat me because I'm a Christian and I says in the Bible that the husband should be. I just won't go with that kind of stuff. If it's physical violence, if it's, you know, something that hurts people or hurts themselves, I have to stand opposed to it just for moral things and also legal reasons because I'm a therapist. But generally within that broad range of things, most people will tell you what they're suffering from, what they're concerned about, and what they long for. That's where I start. Excellent. Excellent. And when it comes to creating a story or finding a story that would help evoke the resources for them to get there, what's your process for coming up with a story? Do you create them on the spot? Do you make oh, them? I remember them, actually. I rem I rem and it, it's a terrible thing to ask me now because when I first started, I learned sort of a David Gordon's isomorphism model, if you know yeah. that. You yeah, I remember that. And, um, and that was a very formal model, but you could make stuff up and put it in there and make it fit. You know, it was a squirrel family, just like this family in front of you. It was a squirrel family. So you could do that stuff. I couldn't remember all those stories. I would feel a lot of pressure to make them up. And I learned those models. So what I'm telling you is probably not that helpful for people listening, but I learned a bunch of models of telling stories that were 
helpful to people. That is the parallel of their situation in some way. That's the isomorphism, and sorry to use a terrible word that uh, he used, but I, I loved that when I first learned it. And um, then I just learned to tell the structure of stories. I learned the structure of helpful stories, therapeutic stories, if you will. And then I just found a bunch in my own experience from people I knew, maybe movies I'd watched. It wasn't that they always had to happen to me, or maybe I saw something in a newspaper or magazine article. Mm -hmm. But usually it's something that I went through myself because those were the easiest to remember. And I had a bunch of details of those stories. So I could use them both with the hypnotic, which is typically a longer storytelling and a slower storytelling style, or the one that I'm using now, which is a little hyper. I tend to be a little hyper that storytelling style. Um, and I just found I had thousands of stories which before I had no idea how to tell a story and I didn't think I had any stories in which when I teach people start to think, oh, you have a thousand stories. I don't have any. You go, yeah, you actually do. <laughs> if you go to lunch and a friend said, what did you do yesterday? You tell them a story. You know, I went to this store and this, you know, clerk was rude to me and, you know, I, I got so mad, I ran, I walked out of there and I didn't buy this thing I was, you know, that's a story. And people just don't think of them as stories because they think of stories as those things they hear great storytellers tell. And so I think I just learned I had a million, thousands of stories, I don't know, a million, but I have thousands of stories and they come up by association for me. Mm -hmm. When okay. someone talks about something, I go, oh, that reminds me of a story, basically. It's yeah. just how, how I start, typically. Or I just tell the story. Do you, do you tell Erickson's stories? Oh yeah, tell Erickson's stories sometimes, tell my own, tell some of my clients' stories, obviously with disguised details, and so you can't tell who it's about, but I tell those kind of stories all the time. Uh, Erickson's stories are so great because they're so dramatic. He was such a dramatic person, and I'm not quite as dramatic as he was, and he had almost no social limitations. That is, he didn't care if he upset people, if people got pissed off at him. He didn't care if people were anxious during the process. And I'm a little more socially appropriate than he was. I'm a little more caretaking. I'm a little more want people to like me than he was. He didn't care if people liked him. He cared, he didn't want to hurt him, but he cared if he got a result. He didn't care if, how, what they thought about him. As, you know, I saw a book one time, What You Think About Me Is None of My Business, and that was certainly Erickson's. Yeah, Terry Cole. Terry Cole Whitaker, that's right. Boy, you, you still got a couple of brain cells up there. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know what, I never actually read that book, but I love the title. I didn't either. That <laughs> is funny that you say that. I never <laughs> did either, but the title was worth the whole, you know, I've written this book called Do One Thing Different. I've had a thousand people tell me. I never read the book, but I got the point when I read the title. It's like, that, I never read that book either, but the title really stuck with me. But by the way, that is a great book. Your book. Oh, is it? Yeah. It's a great book. Oh, do that, one that's the one that got you on Oprah, isn't it? Yeah, that's the one that got me on Oprah. You're talking about doing things different. You did read that. Okay. I did read that one. Most people just saw the cover, so I, as long as they bought it, that was okay with me. <laughs> no, just joking. I want to read it. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, Quick question. When it comes to that the idea of um, Erickson telling these stories, did he tell the same stories over and over again? Did he repeat his stories? Milton? Just a second, hold on. Oh, that's you leaving me a voicemail. Look at that. I called you somehow. Siri must have called you. Sorry. That, that's Siri. that Doug and Siri okay. said call it. That's it. Sorry, ask that question. Yeah. Does, does there, did Erickson tell the same story over and over again? Did he repeat his stories? I don't think so. Not that I remember. I spent a fair amount of time with him. I worked with him for about a year, 1977. And I don't think he told the same story ever or twice. But no. I read later things where I'd heard him tell that story and in a slightly different way. So I'm sure he repeated himself at times, but not with me. But I didn't spend thousands of hours with him as some people did. I spent 50, 100, I don't know. I worked in his garden, so some of the time he was with me and some of the time I was just working. So, um, But I spent time in his office and I don't, I don't remember him ever repeating a story. And sometimes I, I, I had stories that never were in any of the books and I really loved that. I would. I would try and remember because he told many, many stories when I was with him. A lot of stories. Hmm. I wish I could remember them all. I probably can't. 
Yeah, probably. Well, that's it's it's really really fascinating to me. Um, with with my background, I, I came from a musical background. I didn't study psychology from the get go. Um, I came to it from a very different background. I started um, learning NLP from first Tony Robbins and then Richard Bandler and then Robert Diltz and various other people. And the more that I studied NLP, the more it seemed to be like the people who were really good at it could also do Ericksonian hypnosis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it sort of led me to it from that way. And unfortunately, you'd already passed on by the time I had, you know, gotten around to that level. Um, so I never met the man. I met his, his wife. I, I stopped by the house one time and she was very gracious. Um, she gave me a little tour of the place. Yeah. Sat in his chair. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you can go in. It's a museum now. You can go and visit. Oh, I get didn't tours. Know. Yeah, you can get tours. It's uh, official. And uh, you can see where I worked in his backyard. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> As that. a gardener. Yeah. I saw your garden. Yeah, that's right. Very nice. These bougainvillea vis uh, bushes that I trimmed and uh, some other stuff that I did back there. Very impressive. I have a picture by the tree in the back. Yeah, the tree is now dead. And, you know, they cut a bunch of the branches off, but it was a big Palo Verde tree. It was really nice. Yeah. During its heyday. It's too bad. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm still wanting to make this most valuable for people who are tuning in um, as to how they can best learn. When it comes to the NLP viewpoint, as you said, you know, Bandler was very structured and technical and stuff. Um, were you aware of Erickson using what Bandler would call like embedded commands? And, oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And I asked him about that at one time. So maybe we'll just... I know we're going a little long with this, so maybe we just finished with that story. So one time I came to see Erickson and I had a friend who was a psychologist in Phoenix and I hadn't talked to him in a while. And we were talking on the phone and he said, what are you up to? And I said, well, I'm studying with Milton Erickson. He goes, like, what are you, you know, he was just like, that was his hero. And I was like, yeah, I'm his gardener and I'm learning from him. And he's like, did you have him work with you yet? And I said, no, I'm his student. I'm not his patient. I'm not, I'm not there for therapy. He goes, I don't care. You should have him work with you because it'll tell you how it feels from the inside out to be, you know, have him work with you. Yeah. It never occurred to me. I just didn't think it was appropriate, but he was like, yeah, I don't think he'd mind. Go for it. And so I, you know, was going to work up my courage and ask him the next time I came. And I had a roommate at the time who was going to law school while I was going to graduate school in psychology or psychotherapy. And I have, I, at the time, I was a very finicky eater. I was a finicky eater when I was a kid, and I never grew out of it. I ate like 10 foods. Didn't bother me, but it bothered everybody else. And sometimes it was a little challenging to go out to dinner with people or to go over to their house. So I decided, okay, I'm going to work with them on this. I've done a lot of work on other things. This one doesn't seem to yield. So I get there, and it's the only time I get there when I knock on his door. I've always been there on my own, that his wife... Betty Erickson, Elizabeth Erickson answers the door and says, oh, Milton's out in his office. You can just go right over there. And she didn't tell me anybody else was there, but there were other people there. And I knocked on the door and I, I at the time I was a hippie, I had long hair down here and I had a hat on. I was kind of a dude. And, um, and I walk in and there's one guy hypnotizing another guy in Dr. Erickson's office. I come in in the middle of it and I'm looking at my, I'm like, I was right on time. And I was totally just combined. So talking about the confusion technique, I was just like thrown. And Erickson said, come in, you know, and I opened the door and I see this scene and he looks up at me and he says, kind of harshly, he says, take off that hat, sit on that chair, put it underneath the chair. And I did, you know, I was very compliant. And then the guy was still trying to hypnotize the other guy and maybe two minutes into it, Erickson said, all right, that's enough. He goes, now let me show you how hypnosis should be done. And he <laughs> talked for two hours. He looked at the ground, which Erickson was wont to do, and he talked for two hours. And he told story after story after story after story. The first story was about someone who was a finicky eater <laughs> and had gotten more flexible with Erickson's intervention. The second story was somebody about a finicky eater who got more flexible with Erickson's intervention. The third story was about changing patterns. He talked about, you know, he'd get up early when the first snowstorm happened in Wisconsin, and he'd take great delight in doing a zigzag pattern through the snow to school. And then he'd love to see when he'd come home that all the other kids had followed in his footsteps. And he would then take a straight path home. 
and he'd break the pattern. And it was all about food and changing patterns. And I was like, holy moly, this is really <laughs> weird. So then he says to me, after two hours, he looks up, looks me in the eyes and says, and what can I do for you today, young man? And I said, well, I think you may have already done it, Dr. Erickson. I came here and I talked to this friend and talking about finicky eating and I wanted to get more flexible with my eating. And then all the stories you told were about flexibility and changing patterns and changing food patterns. And he just looked at the ground and he said some more stuff that was about that. And then the session broke up. Those guys went and I was out in the garden with Dr. Erickson. And I worked up my courage because he was so totally intimidating for me. And I was very shy in those days. And I said, Dr. Erickson, how did you know that, you know, did my roommate call you and tell you I was going to come in and talk? He says, no, I didn't talk to your roommate. And I pressed him and he didn't like to explain what he did. But he said, I said, how did you how do you think you knew that that was my issue and that I wanted to work on it today? He said, in 1952, <laughs> two psychologists, two psychiatrists came to see me. They were married. They were having marital problems. And they were from my old stomping grounds back in Michigan. And the one of the psychiatrists, the male, had been married to somebody he said I knew, but he didn't want to tell me her name because he thought it would prejudice me in the case. But I really wanted to know our name. And I pressed him for it, but he wouldn't give it to me. And so we go on with the session. And at a certain point, I stopped the session. And I picked up the phone and I called a friend of mine, Barbara. And I said, Barbara, I don't know why, but I have the strongest urge to call you Nancy. And he looks at the male psychiatrist. And the guy jumps out of his chair and he goes, that's my ex-wife's name. How did you get it? And so that was the answer that he gave me to, how did you know? And I was like, okay, that's not that helpful, Dr. Erickson. <laughs> and a little more, and he said, I think during the session, he was somehow emphasizing the words, the syllables, Nan and C. Like we went to Nantucket, and there you can see the whales. And he must have done it several times, and my unconscious picked up on it because of this interspersal. And he said, if patients can do it, why can't therapists? That was it. So he would teach two stories, uh, obviously. And that was the only time he ever explained to me anything about therapy. He would explain things about gardening that I wasn't sure about. <laughs> do you want me to do this or this? And he goes, that. <laughs> but anything I asked him about therapy was always story time. And he wouldn't explain it. And that was the first time he ever explained things to me. And I was like, thank you. Because I knew that idea from NLP is interspersal and, and uh, the embedded commands and analogical marking, as they called it in NLP land. So I understood that answer, and that was, that was helpful. And it really made it memorable to me to hear it in a story form. So. Yeah, yeah, that's the beautiful thing about stories, is it? Yeah. It's memorable. Yeah. That was 1977. That's a lot of years ago, and I remember him telling that story like it was yesterday. And that is one of the things that, you know, both of us like about stories is you can give people a lot of information, but when it's embedded in a story and when they get it as a story, they may remember the story a little wrong, but they'll get the essence of it typically and they'll get what they need from it typically and they'll remember it for decades often. So, hmm. cool. Did you tell that story on the video about Erickson? I... I've told it a bunch of times. I have no idea. You know, I, I once saw Ted Turner and tell you another story. Once saw Ted Turner on the 25th anniversary of CNN and they got him on there and they said, you know, all the critics were sure, told you this could never work, this 24 hour news cycle. And he goes, they go, he, are you really, you know, so satisfied that you proved him wrong? He said, I don't ever think about it. I only think about the present and the future. And that is almost always true for me. I have no idea what I've done. I'm interested in the next thing I'm doing. So when you ask me, was it on some, probably somewhere, I have no idea. Somebody else knows my work way better than I do, what I've done. I know what I know now and what I'm excited about now. Otherwise, I don't attend to the past too much. That's, uh, that's pretty hip. So you're still a hippie, just to have a different hairstyle. That's exactly right. It's easier to maintain it. I, I got busy after a certain point and I really, well, I had, a, there was another story about cutting my hair. <laughs> we won't go into it. I can tell you stories all day. <laughs> well, I appreciate you spending some time with us. Thank really you for, uh, for doing this. Sorry we went a little long, but those stories, they do go long. 
This has been the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Hope to see you again real soon. Come back next week when we have another gripping and exciting episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. And if you want to, you can find out more about us, each and every one of us, at EssentialCoachingSkills.com. Thanks. Thanks.